UFC Fight Night, Vittori Cannoneer. We're taking a look at the best DraftKings plays and also my top bets on the slate. My name is Kevin Allen, a.k.a. The Geek from DFS Army and Sharp App. And we're going to take a look and we're going to get some bets going here for UFC this Saturday, June 16th. Let's get right into it. I'm actually going to go a little different than usual. So my goal with this breakdown is I'm going to go fight by fight real quick. Not going to put too much on it. We're going to talk about DraftKings spots in terms of fantasy real quick and also any DraftKings or other book bets that I've got going for the slate. Uh, keep in mind, this is not financial advice. You can tell me, you can fame, me, you can do whatever you want. But uh, these are well-researched and any bets that I am giving out are positions that I have personally taken on this card. So let's get right into it. We're starting at the top. Main event, Marvin Vittori taking on Jared Cannonier and couple things. So starting with the fantasy perspective here, Vittorian Cannoneer, uh, main event, five round fight. Neither guy. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give uh, Fedori has been, uh, Vittori has been actually a really good DraftKings producer in five round fights. He's got decent volume takedowns. He does it all, um, you know, potential for knockdowns, uh, potential for grappling. He does it all five rounds of Vittori action at 8k. I think you got to load up on that. He is minus 120 on the sports books as well. So right off the bat, 8,200 versus 8K. You're going to need a piece of this fight, especially with the cancellations that we've had this week on DraftKings. So um, yeah, this is a fight to load up on. I am very much skewing towards Vittori. And spoiler alert, I also have a bet on Vittori this week. Three unit play on Vittori straight up on the money line. I love Vittori in this fight. I'm going to tell you why. Vittori is known to have a bit of a blockhead. He's difficult to knock out. He's never been knocked out. Um, he he held his own against Israel Adesanya. He held his own against uh, Robert Whitaker, even though he lost against the absolute best of the best in the division, right? Jared Cannonier, on the other hand, my, 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 my man Jared Cannonier is, uh, let me pull him up here, but He's 39 years old at this point. Vittori's 29. There's an age gap that I don't like. Cannoneer, exclusively a striker, not much grappling offensively, and certainly a weakness of his has been his defensive grappling. So there's just no... I, I favor Vittori pretty much across the board here. Um, volume, grappling, youth... Opponent quality is kind of similar. Both guys have kind of lost to the best of the best. But um, this one for me is a weird line. I actually think um, Vittori should be about a minus 200 favorite in this fight. Uh, I was able to get this at minus 110. It is currently on, let's see, on DraftKings at minus 125. So you've got a bit of a moment in time here with a pretty good number. You can still get in on it. That is a three unit play for me. Remember, unit size should be anywhere from 1% to 2% of your bankroll. So for me, not financial advice, give me Vittori to win. I'm taking the bet. I really love both sides of this on DraftKings, but more so for the price in the five rounds than I do for these specific fighters. All right, next up, Arman Saryukin taking on Joaquim Neto BJJ Silva. You know, Saryukin's a minus 1,000 favorite in this spot. There's not all that much to talk about. Saryukin is a fantasy producer. Um, his previous fights, 117, 110, 126, 99 against Amir Ismagulov, seven takedowns along the way, three-round fight. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Saryukin priced at 9,800. You ready for this? You could probably fade this fight just because of the salary. So in tournament, in cash games, of course, lock it in. But in tournaments, at 9,800, it is wildly difficult for a fighter to produce a score big enough to pay off. He effectively needs to win this fight in the first 60 seconds. I don't really think that's going to happen. I think there are a lot of other high-scoring fights potentially on this card. So you do you, but if you got the balls, this might be the spot maybe to fade on DraftKings. I certainly will not be betting this at minus 1,000. There's just no point in even including a minus 1,000 fighter, although Saryukin should easily win. There's no point in, in even including a minus 1,000 spot in a parlay. That's just going to bust your parlay. It doesn't help your parlay. It only hurts it. So um, fade both on the betting window 
and probably on DraftKings uh, Fantasy. It's probably a fade, unfortunately. All right, next up, we've got Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Armin Petrosian. And this fight reeks of a low-scoring stinker on DraftKings. Um, Petrosian... He's been he's been in the uh, he's been in the UFC for a while. He's a kickboxer. Doesn't really have much grappling or grappling defense, as you could see here. Twenty five percent takedown defense is bad. Um, we haven't seen uh, lots of volume though on the striking for Armin Petrosian, and he's been winning fights. So here's what happens: like he can't stop a takedown, and yet he wins the fight. Right? Gregory Rodriguez wins the decision. Why? Because he gets back up and he just tosses volume on his opponents. Um, Christian Leroy Duncan hasn't done much in terms of grappling in the UFC. Uh, I think there is, this is a bettable spot on Armin Petrosian. I think it's a little bit weird, quite honestly, that Christian Leroy Duncan is the favorite. I did not make, bet here, um, so I don't have an official play here. But if you feel the need for action, to me, the side is with Petrosian as a sort of bonus. I'm going to just show you quality of opponent here. With Christian Leroy Duncan, a win over Dusko, that is nothing. Right, he knocked him out in two seconds. Big deal, right? Um, Petrosian has wins against pretty decent opponents. AJ Dobson, good. Uh, Robocop, uh, Gregory Rodriguez, good. So, I, I mean, uh, this was a contender series, so I don't know too much about this opponent, but every single time the story remains the same. His opponents try to take him down, they do take him down because he can't stop a takedown. Then he gets back up, and when he's standing, he's just lighting him up because he is a professional kickboxer. Um, on price picks, I would keep an eye on the Petrosian significant strikes. Let's see if we can find that one. Yeah, they don't even have it. So they screwed us. Forget that. Um, anyway, no bet here or, or the bet here would be Petrosian, but not an official play for me. I did not, I did not pull the trigger, but that would be the side that I'm leaning on. And Petrosian just comes through as an underdog a lot. As far as DraftKings, this one is an avoid. I don't think this fight is going to score well. Um, though again, if I'm playing a side, it's most uh, likely going to be the Petrosian side. So I'll mix him in just a little bit on my tournament entries on DraftKings. And I'm staying away from this one probably in cash games, unless I absolutely need, you know, a punt like Petrosian, who I think can probably put up a decent, like 70 or 80 pointer, um, if he, if he wins as an underdog, let's just take one last look at his previous fights. Yeah. I mean, he's scoring 77 to 81 with these wins, tons of volume, but he just doesn't have that finishing power, um, or any sort of grappling upside or anything like that, that really gets you where you want to be. All right. Next up, Pat Sabatini taking on Lucas Almeida Sabatini, a grappler, a relentless grappler. Um, not much of a striker there. He just wants to wrestle, wrestle and wrestle some more could win by submission. You know, that's what wrestlers do. Lucas Almeida is a really interesting case here in the sense that he's a tough guy, but the takedown defense is not very good. So you could see here, Pat Sabatini averaging almost four takedowns per fight and the takedown defense of his opponent here, Almeida 50%. It's a bad scene. Um, with that being said, the volume and, and striking of Lucas Almeida is massively superior to that of Sabatini. So full blast striker versus grappler matchup. I'm going to take a look at um, Almeida's previous fights. And here he lost to Daniel Zellhuber in the contender series, got taken down um, in that fight. Then he fights uh, Michael Triziano, full striking, no takedowns, three rounds. And, you know, he just didn't have to use the grappling. So this is going to be a different kind of fight compared to what Lucas Almeida uh, is normally doing. Let's get a quick look at his previous opponents to see, you know, if there are any other, say, uh, if there are any other um, grapplers that we recognize that he defeated. And there's not much of that. The record um, outside of just very recently has been uh, very sketchy. He's fighting in jungle fights. He lost on the contender series. So um, I'm going with Pat Sabatini here to wrestle his way to a win. But certainly um, Almeida is live and will both of these sides are going to be really, really good on DraftKings. Almeida with the massive grappling upside on DraftKings. I'm um, sorry, Sabatini with the massive upside grappling upside on DraftKings. That scores well. And let's take a look at his previous scores just for a little further um, confirmation. 106, 105, 90, uh, 83. So he's put up decent scores here. Um, I, the end, the 90 pointer. I mean, am I going to hold against him? He beat 
Jamal Emmers, like one strike thrown. He didn't have to do anything. Just the submission. That's crazy. Um, the Tristan Connolly fight is concerning. I think it's Tristan Connolly. That one is concerning because why would this guy fight uh, for all of those minutes without going for any takedowns? Six takedowns against Laramie, five against uh, Lutz. And yet, what was this Connolly fight? Are you trying to prove that you're, you can strike? What are you doing? Tristan Connolly's a bit of a grappler himself. <sighs> so that one was a weird one. Maybe Connolly was such a bad striker that <laughs> he kept it standing. I'm not really sure what happened in that fight, but I don't see that happening here. Um, last thing Sabatini's going to want to do is stand with Almeida. So Sabatini very, very much in play on DraftKings at 9,100. Again, a good score. Could easily outscore Saryukin, who's 700 more. So um, great spot. I think he's going to be kind of low owned on DraftKings as well. He's minus 200. Everything points to Sabatini, but certainly Almeida is a live dog on DraftKings as well. In terms of a bet, no bet for me on this fight. I just don't like it. I think um, fight goes to decision would be something I'm actually kind of interested in. Maybe the over two and a half rounds of plus 100. I, I, I'd lean that way. So if I need to put a lean on this one, I'm going to lean the over here because Sabatini has tons of cardio. And if he's executing his grappling based game plan, I don't I don't think he gets a finish. I don't think he's going to submit uh, his opponent here. I'd be actually more worried about Almeida knocking out Sabatini. Uh, at some point late in the second or or early third round to bust that one up. But over two and a half rounds would be my unofficial pick for a bet on this fight. All right. So, but load up on this one on DraftKings. Next one is almost an all-in on DraftKings. Probably an all-in for me in terms of fantasy. Nicholas Mata taking on Manuel Torres. And um, these guys are both wild fighters, especially Torres. He's just a maniac in the cage fight inside the distance is an incredible minus 335 so this fight this fight i'm expecting violence both of these guys bring the violence in their fights and torres has just been looking great lately um again torres inside the distance yeah mata inside the distance plus 180 torres inside the distance uh plus 120 these are just really really good numbers uh, across the board these are the kind of numbers that lead to DraftKings explosions of scoring even if there isn't a finish and it is fully expected under one and a half rounds, minus 160, that this fight will end quickly. Even if there isn't, I think the volume alone gets you there. Neither guy is super, super high priced on DraftKings. You got Torres here at 8,900. So, so, uh, and, and Mata 7,300 love this pay up price, right? You're going to see, but Mata as well, super live in this spot. I think Torres though is probably the better fighter. Hard to know. Everybody's going to knock out Camacho. Like he's so, he's so washed. But before that, you know, again, kind of beating nobodies for the most part, but doing it fast. His wins come quickly. Round one, round one. So again, this is a spot where Nicholas, uh, Nick, Nicholas Mata is a, probably a significantly better opponent than what. Torres has been facing. I think these guys are both kind of low level, both up and coming, but I think we should see lots of violence. So this is a fight I want heavy exposure to uh, on both sides on DraftKings. Uh, again, those inside the distance props speak for themselves. Like it's minus 160 under one and a half. You got to load up both sides. As far as a bet, I have no bet on this one. Um, there's just no value. I, I don't want to pick a winner. If I had to, I would probably just go with the underdog just because you get the plus money, but I'm not picking a winner there. I think uh, I'm leaning Torres, but I think the line is pretty pretty spot on. Next up, we got Nicholas Dalby against Muslim Salikov. And right off the bat, that, that looks like DraftKings poison. Um, neither of these fighters scores well when they win. They have long histories. Outside of last week's crazy, um, you know, Ayman Zahabi, like fast, unexpected knockout. So you get a couple points of exposure maybe to both sides for that reason. But beyond that, Muslim is super tough going to be tough for Dalby to really put up much points against and Muslim never puts up a good score in his fights you could just I mean win 80 points win 82 a win 46 a win 70 this is not enough 9200 what are you crazy 
Hell no. He got that fast finish against um, uh, Taleb. 104. So that's his ceiling. Could it happen? Sure. But I mean, Dolby's pretty tough. Uh, so I'm only, I'm only playing for like the, the, the first round finish. And those are super, super low odds. Again, Dolby, he's cheap. So that's great. But he also doesn't score particularly well when he wins a fight. And no one scores all that well against Muslim Salkov. So to me, this fight is pretty much DraftKings poison. If I had to pick a side for, for at the betting window, A, let's take a look at the fight goes to decision prop. It's going to be high. It's going to be too much. So it's not going to be good. Like, um, let's see. Fight go ends ends by decision. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Where is where the hell is that damn prop? Fight goes the distance. Minus 165. I kind of like, there it is. So minus 150, minus 160. Fight goes the distance. That'd be the side I lean on. I'm not sure I'm, I want to pay minus 165. So I don't have a bet on that one. But that would definitely be the side that I would be on. Fight goes the distance, minus 160. And maybe we'll find a parlay to put that one into. Next up, I do have a spot that I like on this one. But it's Alessandro Costa taking on Jimmy Flick. Costa minus 280. Jimmy Flick plus 240. This is DraftKings. Go another really, really good one for DraftKings because this fight will probably go one of two ways. Either Flick finds a gets his wrestling going and finds a submission, or he gets knocked out by Costa. Flick does not look like the kind of fighter that enjoys or has any interest in taking damage. He does not like that. He is almost exclusively a grappler and just has not looked good, especially when his takedown game isn't working. He's almost exclusively a BJJ submission grappler. That's pretty much all he can do. And I think Ryan Hall, but maybe not as good of a version, if that's even possible to say. Um, the under two and a half rounds here, minus 210, and I agree with that. Fight ends inside the distance, minus 270. This tells us that this fight is super likely to end with a finish. And I think that Flick either can get a takedown and quickly submit Costa, or Flick gets finished in this fight. And I do think Alice, so we'll take a quick look at um, any stats to see if we can glean anything. And, you know, it's not good. So Costa, 87% takedown defense. That includes a fight against Amir Albazi, who is very, very good at getting takedowns. Um, if he can stop the takedowns from Jimmy Flick, I think he's going to knock him out. So, Alessandro Costa inside the distance by KO TKO. So, let's take a look for that prop. Costa inside the distance minus 140. Costa wins by KO TKO plus 115. So, dog money, Costa by KO TKO. I'm going to take a quarter unit stab on this one. Just a little, little, little taste, little taste, little dip, little dip the toe. Um, I don't like to go too heavy on props, but specifically, I don't want to pay minus 280. So, and I don't think he's going to win by submission, although you never know. Um, I could see Jimmy Flick submitting to strikes, and I don't even know if that counts as a TKO or a submission. I'm not sure what that would count as. That'd be weird. If I were to take Jimmy Flick, it would just be Flick by submission, but I'm not doing that. That's plus 400. So if I wanted to, let's say, hedge this or have another side of this one, Flick by submission, that's the only way Flick probably wins this fight. But I am not going there. I love this fight for DraftKings purposes, though. Um, it's not that you could you can't load up on it because Mata at, um, not Mata, Costa at 9,400, just so expensive that he legitimately needs that fast finish to get there. He's totally in play, though, for being the nuts pay up on this slate. And he could, he could win in 90 seconds he can get some knockdowns along the way there's a lot of ways that costa can score 115 120 with a fast win and flick if he does his thing gets a takedown is able to find that submission he is a lock button for the nuts at 6800 so i'll probably actually wind up with um a decent amount of flick just for that possibility maybe 15 20 percent and I'll have some Costa, and I'm going to have him in the mix because i think he's just as good as any of the other payup options in terms of the likely scoring Next fight, Kyung Ho Kang taking on Christian Quinones. Quinones, the favorite here. That's kind of weird for me, um, but there we are. Quinones, the favorite. Um, 
at minus 135 to minus 140. Let's just see where DraftKings has it. I always like to look at the DraftKings numbers. Uh, yeah, minus 140, uh, minus 135 on DraftKings and see plus 115. So the line has been coming together and I agree with it. I, I picked Kang earlier in the week um, to get this win when it was like, yeah, it was, I think it was plus 130 or plus 140 on this one, which was even more intense. And now those numbers are just coming together. I think rightfully so. Kyung Ho Kang is super well-rounded. Um, he, you know, he's got takedowns, he's got striking, he got volume, he does everything you'd want in a fighter in the UFC. Um, you know, two takedowns per 15. So he does go for it. Striking about three strikes landed per minute. The flip side here, Christian Quinones, much more of exclusively a striker, has higher volume, um, and has had decent takedown defense, but he's fought, you know, Khalid Taha. That that that, that number was established against non-grapplers. Khalid Taha is not a guy who um normally is going for takedowns and i don't even know who the previous opponent was or what his deal is but let's see if we could figure that one out i actually hadn't long i don't even know who that is that must have been a contender series yeah long Zhao, you know chinese fighter generally these guys are not grapplers so um he establishes 100 percent takedown defense against guys who really aren't very good at getting takedowns Kyungho Kang probably does get a couple of tank downs. I like the Kang side for DraftKings. This is not, this one does not seem like it's going to score well. If we take a look, let's take a look at the inside of the distance prop just to further this point. Fight goes the distance minus 150. So it is leaning towards going the distance. There's nothing that Christian Quinones does outside of knockdowns or a finish or anything that will score well. He doesn't grapple at all. He hasn't done that. And I don't expect him to do it here. So unless he's landing 140 strikes or winning inside the distance, um, he's not going to do us much good on DraftKings for fantasy purposes. And I think Kyung Ho Kang can match his volume and get some takedowns and steal a win. My plus 115 is getting a little tight. I liked it a lot more at plus 135. Um, but if I'm playing a side here, it is the Kang side. No official bet, but this one is a fade on fantasy DraftKings. All right, next up, we've got Carlos Hernandez taking on Dennis Bonder. Hernandez is a plus 115 underdog, plus 110. Comeback on Bonder is minus 122. I do have a bet on this fight. So Dennis Bonder is a relentless grappler type, right? He he just comes in. He is not waiting for anybody or anything. He comes in and he grapples, goes for takedowns. And I, I in his first fight, he was a heavy favorite against Malcolm Gordon. Winds up losing the fight. Gets knocked out. Gets knocked out early. That, not, actually, not, he did not get knocked out. I'm sorry. I said it wrong. He gets the takedown. Let me explain what happened in this Gordon fight. Bonner comes in, does what he normally does. Goes in, goes for the takedown, achieves it. Now he's in top position, ground and pound. Malcolm Gordon slinking around under there, finds the arm, is, is doing it, you know, gets a Kimura going, switches that into a... Um, into an arm bar. And at one point he's twisting that arm really hard. And my understanding was the arm broke. Now Bonder doesn't even submit at that point, gets back up, but now he's fighting. He's not looking right. Gordon gets the takedown and kind of dominates the rest of the fight and gets the finish. Right. But it all started with Bonder coming in, coming in hot first fight in the UFC goes for the takedown, gets it, you know, and, and, and Gordon, Gordon gets the, the arm bar. Fine. Bonder was a minus 350, minus 400 favorite in that fight. Let's actually go back. So Bonder was this guy who was super, super high regarded before that fight. And then he loses to a not very good Malcolm Gordon. And all of a sudden now he sucks now. Okay, maybe, right? He did lose the fight. He did lose the fight to Gordon. But look what he was doing before that, you know, Fine, this was a crappy opponent, but I mean the opponents weren't good. But finish, 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 finish. Arm, you know, a lot of a lot of um, submissions along the way. I love submissions, right? Now, of course, he's fought. He's only fought a bunch of zeros. So the question is, was it just him padding his uh, record in this weird, you know, fighting league? And the second he stepped up to a real UFC level and 
or kind of low level UFC opponent really with Malcolm Gordon, all of a sudden he didn't look very good. That did happen. So do we agree? Does it change the valuation of Dennis Bonder? I'm going to give him one more shot. And I think I like what he does. I like that style of grappler. And more importantly, um, and, and listen, this Hernandez kid is not bad either, but he does have a weakness and that weakness is takedown defense, right? It has not been good. 11%. I mean, that's one of the worst numbers you're ever going to see. Nascimento completely dominated him with his grappling. And so to me, Dennis Bonder should come in here and potentially just dominate with his grappling. And he should be able to win a decision against Carlos Hernandez here at minus 130 odds. Of course, Dennis Bonder is a, I love this play on DraftKings. I like both sides of this one because Dennis Bonder is a favorite, but he's priced as an underdog on DraftKings. That's already really nice. Plus he is a takedown guy. He is a relentless grappler against a guy who can't stop takedowns. So I really like that. This fight can score incredibly well. There's potential for the fight to score incredibly well on DraftKings Fantasy. And as for a bet, I'm taking my shot at minus 125 odds on Denny's Bonder one unit to win one unit. All right, next up we've got Teresa Bleda against Gabriela Fernandez. And pretty much Bleda is a submission grappler. Uh, at least that's kind of the sense I get. Um, she fought Natalia Silva in her last fight, held her own, I thought was winning the fight until Natalia um, got the finish. There's not a lot of striking going on here. Um, it's mostly grappling. She's going for takedowns, and she's been able to finish a bunch of her opponents. And again, this is low-level women's MMA, so finishing your opponent is fine. You know, like, it's not that impressive, so to speak, right? These women who she's fought, there are a bunch of effectively nobodies, right? I don't know. I heard of any of them. These are not UFC level fighters, but she did hold her own against uh, Natalia Silva in a loss that looks much better in hindsight. Fernandez only one fight in the UFC so far, and that was uh, a dominating performance by Jasmine Jazz Dravicious against her. But along the way, what was happening? Takedown after takedown after takedown, right? So here we've got Teresa Bleda who wants takedowns wants to grapple against an opponent with 50% takedown defense. Now, again, that's against Jasmine and, you know, it's no shame in getting taken down by Jasmine, Jasmine vicious. Um, maybe Fernandez, you know, didn't show her best game there, but it's not like she's got uh, the who's who of wins either. She's got a bunch of nobodies on her record. Give me the submission grappler who looked good against Natalia Silva versus the um, who uh, Natalia Silva, who probably destroys Jasmine. Jazz Davicious, rather than uh, give me the one who look rather than the one who lost to Jasmine. So give me Teresa Blade. I think the line is correct. I don't see any reason here to bet this minus two twenty women's MMA. There's no way I'm doing that as far as a bet. But it's important. This fight is important because you want to keep Teresa in your DraftKings lineup grouping, right? I, I don't want to. I'm not going to uncheck her. She's too expensive, of course. She's ridiculously priced at 9500 Has no proof that she should be priced there. I think she's kind of fadeable, except for the fact that, again, she might get a quick takedown and submission, and if she could do that, she could score well. So GPP only, I'll get a little taste of Teresa Bleda. I'll certainly allow Fernandez in some lineups as well, just because women's MMA, underdogs can win, and if this kind of underdog wins, she should, you know, 6700 allow me to have some real studs in my lineup but not a fight I want to focus on and no bet for me here. Next up, we got Ronnie Lawrence taking on Dan Argueta. Lawrence is a minus 190 favorite in this one. Argueta plus 165. And this one is pretty straightforward. Both of these guys, this is DraftKings gold. Ronnie Lawrence has been one of the great DraftKings scorers of our time. Um, he's no, you know, Marab is the king, but Ronnie Lawrence is right up there. You know, of course, Khabib, and we got all these guys. Ronnie Lawrence, six takedowns, eight takedowns, 131, 135. These scores are unbelievable. Throws little sigs as he's fighting. Does everything you want. Again, two monster scores. 
including one achieved in a decision. Now, of course, he got three knockdowns in that fight. But that's the thing about Ronnie Lawrence. He can strike. He can grapple. He's really well-rounded. He got grappled by um, Kakramanov in his previous fight and got out-grappled as a grappler. And I think that's the fear here, and I think that's why the, the odds and the line is where it is. It looks like it has moved a bit. So let, let me go to a normal sports book here. Let me go to, yeah, here we go. So minus what the, the money has come in on Ronnie Lawrence as the week has progressed. And I think that is the correct thing, right? So Ronnie Lawrence, Dan Argueta is also a grappler. Let's take a look at their stats. He's also a grappler, but poor takedown defense, 50%. Now Lawrence also shows poor takedown defense. That's because Kakramanov took him down 11 times. One guy, but, um, Argueta 50% takedown defense, nothing special is a grappler, will offensively grapple, but I would call him the, the I don't know, I, I don't know who's grappling is better, right? I don't know. You can't, you can never really know. It's hard to know. I mean, you can sometimes know, but generally you don't know, especially with kind of guys like this. Can he come out and all of a sudden grapple the shit out of Ronnie Lawrence and win? Of course. But I think it's more even, or maybe Lawrence might be better, but I definitely think Lawrence is the better striker. So um, I like Lawrence in this fight to get this win. I don't mind him as a parlay piece um, at minus 190. I don't think I'm going to take that straight up. Um, if I was to mess with Ronnie Lawrence, it might be by decision, but I don't think I'm going to do that either. I don't like it. I don't like it. I just like Lawrence. This fight is one to load up on DraftKings, though. You, uh, you pretty much have to be, I'll be close to all in on this one, more so on the Lawrence side, but I'll have some Argueta as well. So probably like 75, 25 in that range, uh, Lawrence to Argueta. But I love Lawrence here. A guy has put up 130, 135. His opponent wants to grapple everything, all the makings of DraftKings gold right here for fantasy purposes. Load up on it. And I'll show you at the end kind of the basic of how to construct the lineup. I got to remember not to forget how to construct a lineup for this card using the all ends that I've talked about. So we'll get you the baseline of how most of your lineups should look or would look potentially this week. All right. Last one on the card. It's Bukowskis against Zach Pauga. And this one just reeks of low scoring decision win for one side or the other. I definitely don't like it. Medeskis Bukowski does have some power, but for the most part, he's just a low volume uh, technical striker, Zach Pauga, I, nothing real technical about him. He's more of a, I guess he's got some grappling uh, in him, but it's more of a, of a push and control style grappling, not a relentless takedowns guy. You know, I'd be shocked if Pauga got more than two takedowns over the course of three. I, you know, he hasn't had any takedowns in his UFC career so far, but you know, Bukowskis can be taken down. That's a bit of a weakness of his. So I'd be surprised if Pauga though got any more than one or two takedowns. Bukowskis, if you take a look at his scores, even when he's won, it's been really, really ugly. 52-pointer. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get worse than that. Uh, Mikalidis, this was a bit of a BS win. But anytime you win in that first round, fine, you're going to get there. Nothing really impressive to me about Bukowskis, though I think he probably can get the job done here against Zach Pago, but I don't think he scores enough to justify the 9K salary. Pauga, on the other hand, no takedowns in his UFC career so far. Could he get one? Maybe. But, man, if you can't finish Jordan Wright, I don't think you could finish anybody. I just don't think you can finish anybody. I think Bukowskis would finish Jordan Wright all day. So, for me, this is Bukowskis probably wins, but no bet and and a full fade on DraftKings. So, um, let me just real quick go over how to put together what I just talked about in terms of the fades and the plays on DraftKings. So, we already talked about it. We're going to pick one from the main event, right? I like Vittori, so I start my lineup there. There's a couple of other all-in fights that we've got on this card. One of Torres or Nicholas Mata, pick your poison, right? I can go one way or the other. I can go Mata, I can go Torres. Don't care, don't care. Don't. Care. All right, we'll go expensive, make it hard. Fine. Now, um, we're going to choose. I'm going to play Dennis Bonder, takedowns, grappler, favorite. Put him in the lineup, right? Um, now, we've got Lawrence Argueta. Got to pick one. Again, going with Lawrence here. That leaves us with two spots and above uh, mean salary remaining. So almost every lineup I, I build is going to have some version of this. Almost everyone. Now we just got to find the last spot. So which is the underdog that we feel comfortable with? 
and it could go anyone. Uh, any one of these underdogs that we feel good about is is um, is certainly in play. Let's uh, let's see here. We're not. I don't want to touch Silva, Petrosian. Maybe I guess I, I I don't mind it. Lucas Almeida against Sabatini. Sure, why not? I mean that can work. If we did uh, Almeida, we got ninety four hundred left, so we can go to Costa to finish up that lineup. And that's just kind of how I would do it. And then I'm you know I'll put this one in, and just like like I said, we'll show another version of it. We're going to import, bring that one back, right? Yeah, we're going to bring this one back. Here you can see another version of it that I did right there. And now I'm going to switch up. All right, I did a I did an Almeida one with with um Costa. Okay, I don't want to do that again. So now I might go Nicolas Mata, pull out Torres. Again, I'm sticking with the fights that I said I wanted to load up on and just kind of work in both sides of them. Uh, we'll go back to Costa here. And we've got 8,700 left, and we can pick um, somebody in that range. I don't have anybody in that range. So what the hell did I do here? Yeah, it could go to Argueta. You just kind of switch it up. Like, oh, I already played one with a couple of these guys that I liked. And again, I just want Lawrence in or or his opponent, Argueta, in every lineup that I make. I want Vittori or his opponent in every lineup. I want Bonder in pretty much every lineup. And I want one of Sabatini or Lucas Almeida. So in this one, I'll put Sabatini in there because I want one of him or his opponent in pretty much most of my lineups. Let's see. Finish this one out. We can go Petrosian and an $8,700 guy. I can go, I don't like the $8,700 guy. So again, I need one of Mata or Torres. So in this one, we go with Mata. And I've got 9K left. That's Bukowskis. Don't like that. Um, yeah, it gets, yeah. Torres already played his opponent. Yeah. In this one, we're probably playing either Quinones or Bukowskis which I don't love, but that's what's left. So it does look like after a couple of, uh, after a couple spots here, I got another way. If we go with, if we go with Almeida, now I can actually afford Saryukin and I can actually upgrade another one of these spots. Yeah. Up to 8,500. So now I can get like somebody else here. Anyway, I don't want to put the actual, lineups in but you get the idea we're building around three or four fights one thing that makes this card a little bit weird on DraftKings is these two fights if you take a look at especially like the zalgas boons the john's uh barcelos fight but especially the zalgas boons it's kind of removed a fight that i thought would produce some really good DraftKings scoring and the other thing is some of the fights that are the mid salaries outside of the main event maybe don't look the greatest um we got we got the main event and, of course, the Dennis Bonder. But we can switch that one up, too, and put in Hernandez in a couple of these. Hey, what if Dennis Bonder really does suck? That kind of thing. So for tournaments, that's how I'm switching it up. And, of course, we've got our bets. The big bet being Marvin Vittori um, to win. I just uh, feel really confident with that play. And um, and we've got a, a smaller play on Dennis Bonder at minus 125. That's it for me, guys. Um, remember to check out the Sharp app if you like betting on sports at all. Just download Sharp app. We've got AI-driven breakdowns. You've got the Sharp Report, all kinds of incredible things going on there for sports bettors. Um, we've got the top props. The top props and Sharp app are the best thing going where you could just bet props and, and our, our projection models just more accurate than the sports book. So you can really, really follow the top props plays. Um, the N NBA version uh, of the betting system was up, I think 60 units for the season. Just follow the top props if you want. And of course, pregame betting odds of uh, all the other stuff and the prize picks Proptimizer tool. And of course, check out DFS army. If you're into daily fantasy sports at all, we've got it all going on in DFS army over the course of the next uh, couple of weeks, we have our summer 50% off sale. Summer 50 gets you 50% off any of our packages. VIP is $69.99 a month. That covers every sport. If you want just MMA, okay, that's $29.99. And again, summer 50 knocks it in half. 
you want to check out our Discord and all that stuff, it's in the link in the description below. Good luck this week, everybody. I will see you on top of the leaderboards.